sisters. We are always courageous, although we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Christopher Duffley was born in May of 2001. He's actually the son of my youngest brother and his girlfriend. And when I received the phone call from my brother, I found out that he was born at only 26 weeks, one pound, 12 ounces. So he's very premature and he was in critical condition. And there were several nights that we were told that Christopher wouldn't make it through the night. And at that point, I prayed for Christopher. And I just asked God to be with my brother and to do what his will would be. And for a long time, I had no contact with my brother, really didn't know what happened to Christopher. And all of a sudden, my heart was moved. Where was my nephew? What happened to him? And on my first phone call to social services, the gentleman knew about Christopher, and he indeed was in foster care. He was totally blind. He had been born with cocaine in his system, and he had a host of other medical issues. My first response to that, or my first feeling to that, was fear. I prayed very intently, and I really, I begged the Lord, I said, could you just show me, show me what you would want? And he did, he answered in my heart. He told me, do not be afraid, that I will take care of everything. We've had challenges and we've had joys. And one of the greatest joys was to hear Christopher make noise, sing, and keep beat. He really didn't talk till about first grade. So when he sang, it was really neat. And it wasn't shortly around that time that we found out that Christopher had perfect pitch. And he started to do remarkable things. And what a joy and what a prophecy that God gave us that these tears would come and they come out of great joy. And when Christopher sings, open the eyes of my heart, he teaches us to not see everything with our eyes, but to see things the way God sees things through our heart. And indeed, I'm singing that today. Open the
What a mighty God we serve. In the six, in, in Psalms 46, we read, The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's continue our worship as we stand and sing number 151, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Praise the Lord. It's a blessing to be with, with you guys this morning. Let's, uh, let's open our hearts to the Lord this morning. Give it all up to him. You are not alone if you are lonely when you feel afraid. You're not the only, we are all the same In need of mercy to be forgiven and be free It's all you've got to lean on, but thank God it's all you need And all the people said amen Whoa, and all the people said amen Give thanks to the Lord for His love said amen if you're rich or poor well it don't matter we go strong you know love is what we're after we're all broken but we're all in this together god knows we stumble and fall and he so loved the world he gave us something to stay 
gave us all And all the people said amen Whoa, whoa, whoa And all the people said amen Give thanks to the Lord For His love never ends And all the people said amen The sit on the poor in spirit And the drawn apart Blessed are the persecuted and the pure in heart. Blessed are the people hungry for another start. For this is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And all the people said amen. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. People said amen again, and all the people said amen. Whoa, whoa, whoa. and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends, and all the people said amen. And all the people said amen. Amen. Y'all are on fire this morning.
Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. All together. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Amen. 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 Please remain standing if you're able as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I've been, uh, I've been attending annual conferences for 25 years. Uh, trying to consider what, it's, what I would compare it to. No, because getting a tooth pulled is over too quick. I, you know what? I, 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 it occurred to me something, but I can't say it here. <laughs> okay, so annual conferences are always, they're political. There's lobbying out in the hallways. There's people with one agenda, and this vote's coming up, and we want you to support this and that and the other thing. It's just, you know, honestly... And then towards the end, um, it was just ugly. So I went to the first annual conference of the Florida Conference of the Global Methodist Church two weeks ago. We, we sang. We worshipped. We listened to inspirational speakers. We listened to amazingly uh, gifted Bible teachers. We sang and praised some more. Uh, and that was pretty much annual conference. We did two pieces of business in two and a half days. Well, no, there was three. We, we ordained about 70 new ministers in the Global Methodist Church. Huh? And one of them was, was ours. That's right. Don Keen. So then we had a vote. We did have, we had two votes. The first vote was to select those who would go to the national conference of the Global Methodist Church, and that was, that was a piece of cake. Uh, nobody, nobody made speeches, nobody, you know, the, the guy, the guy up said, said, any one of these people are qualified, you know, spiritually and otherwise to go, you know, and, and we got it, and we, we voted. The next vote was to approve the budget. Yeah, I know. It's like, oh boy. And it's like the music just grinds down to a halt. No, not this time. So of the, the 2023 budget for our former denomination was $8,000 or $8 million here in Florida. The budget that we approved two weeks ago was $555,000. There are three full-time paid staff in the whole annual conference. The, we, we refer now to our district superintendents by a, a name that has a little bit more scriptural basis. They're called presiding elders. None of them are paid salary. All of them pastor churches full-time. Okay. So, and they said, look, if you need, a, you need one of us to come talk to your church, we're not going to be able to do that. We've we got churches of our own. So, 
So our annual connectional giving went from $36,000 to $8,000. So that's the report from annual conference. Any questions about that or anything related to that? How many churches? About 170, I think. Yeah. Richard? No, it's not. A, we don't call them apportionments. We call it connectional giving, which again is so the giving, the the giving that we. Oh, by the way, I. How many of you have ever been to annual conference before in your life? Okay, wow, you guys live in a sheltered life. <laughs> we'll have to do something about that. Okay, well, it's too late because it'll all be good now. Um, when they showed the budget, they showed every line item and every dollar amount. They showed what, what the bishop is going to be paid. They showed what the administrator and, and the other person is going to be paid. They showed all that stuff, everything. You know, It was all right out there in the open. Pretty refreshing. All right. As we go to the Lord in prayer, we continue to be a congregation, a family that is experiencing the full spectrum of life. Some of us have things for which we are rejoicing. And some of us have things for which we are mourning. You know, Paul said to the church, he said, mourn with those who mourn. And he said, rejoice with those who, re who rejoice. And that is how we maintain ourselves as the body of Christ. It's not, you know, it's, we're, it's not a label. It's not a club. We're not a civic organization. We're not a 501c3 nonprofit. We're an organism that's been given life by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. And, and we should always live like one, yes? yes? Yeah. So as we go to prayer, bear in mind that those close to you, nearby physically, may have needs that you need to be sensitive to and reach your heart out to the Lord on their behalf. Heavenly Father, what a joy to gather in your name with the power of the Holy Spirit present. And we reach to you who are far and away above every other resource in our lives. So far in a way that we really cannot, not only can we not perceive it, Lord, but we can't even perceive what we can't perceive. You, you are the one that we lift our hearts to. We trust in that which we do not understand. We rely upon it. We have bet our lives and our eternities on it. Touch these dear ones here who are hurting, who are experiencing loss, who are experiencing worry and concern. Extend, Father, your hand of healing to those who are suffering. And Father, I, I pray that you might all, that you might wound just a little bit each of us in such a way that we feel the pain of those in need, that we see the, the, the loss, that we see the hunger that we see the desperate circumstances in which some people live and that we would be moved in some way to action. And so be the hands of Christ extended. In whose name we pray. Let us pray together the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare our hearts to give, let's Go to the Lord in prayer. This is the time where we make 
our love visible through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Let's give with cheerful hearts. Heavenly Father, over and over, your grace sustains us. Over and over, your love provides for us. Over and over, your arm steadies us. We give you these gifts with gratitude and joy, thankful that you are God over all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The ushers would come forward. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 21 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. 
No sooner than they are planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows, blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look into the heavens. Who created all these things? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles, they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. This is the word of God. Yeah. Sometimes, I got to tell you, sometimes I feel like a, a bull trying to get out of the gate. I just, you know, it's like I'm, I am ready to do this. I am ready to do this. <laughs> and uh, so why are you saying that? Because I'm ready to do this. Yeah, congratulations. Peanut gallery, right up front. Uh, you know, so if everybody that has lived past the age of three, maybe, or more, has encountered life experiences that, ha that have taken what you understand about life and God and just shattered it. it I mean, even though we hear these things and they, and they are tragic to us because they, they happen to other people, but sooner or later it happens to us, and the same thing happens. It just shakes you like a palm tree in a hurricane. It just rattles you, and, and sometimes we don't bend, we break. And this passage of Scripture was given to us by God for that very reason. And I pray to God that I can convey it to you in a life-changing way because this is powerful. Did you, by the way, did you notice, Just did you happen to notice what it says in verse 22 when Henry read it? God stands above what? Excuse me? The circle of the earth. I thought it was flat. Huh? I mean, God knew. And the, the, the writer, you know, Isaiah, he must have he said, well, I, I, okay, I got to write it down like that, but it sure sounds stupid. Isn't that, I mean, isn't that kind of something? Did you know that was in the Bible? That, that the, we knew that, that they knew the world was round like what? 1,500 years before everybody else did? I think it's pretty cool. Huh? Yeah, 712. So we found out, we found out what, 1,400? So that's 15, 2,200 years before. That's, that's, that's cool enough right there. All right. So, and it perfectly represents the power behind this passage. God already knew the earth was round. God knows everything. The things that God can know the things that God can do, the things that God can relate to is completely outside of our ability to comprehend. It is, it is vital that we understand that. It is vital that we realize that that is the case and there's nothing that we can do about it. You remember the, uh, you remember the movie... Um, Bruce Almighty, remember that one? The scene where he's lying in bed and he's hearing all these prayers and he can't sleep. See, that's hilarious, but 
That doesn't impact God. First of all, God doesn't need sleep, and God doesn't sleep. God's, God's otherness from, from humanity. Otherness is the only word that I can think of. God's complete apartness from, from humanity is, is everything that makes him something other than an alien. Because, because the, the, you know, the fact that we are created in his image, that's a part that was left out. Okay? God's being completely, you know, God was God created. He's completely separate from creation. He's not impacted by creation. And that includes time. Time does not exist in eternity. Time is a part of creation. Time passes here in a certain way. It passes on Jupiter in a very different way. It passes closer to the sun in yet another different way. Time is, is a rubber band around the creation and completely apart from God. But God is great to the extent that God knows how time impacts us. God does not experience boredom, but he understands that if we are in one place and not too much happens, we get bored. We pull out our telephone. It's the truth. You know you do. Well, 40 years ago, if that happened, we'd just pull out our book, right? Sitting in the doctor's office. You're, you're waiting. You're late for the appointment. So you, if you don't pull out your book, you walk over to the table. Huh? Magazines. Have you seen magazines in doctor's offices lately? No, because everybody's got a phone. Right? So God understands that boredom impacts me and you, but God does not participate in the boredom. God, God understands that when, when I'm walking around the house in the dark and my shin connects with the coffee table, that words that I never say in church come to my brain. God understands that that happens, but that's not, that is not God. So, non-church words we call them. Only when we recognize the significance of this reality can we experience the peace and the strength that we need for the darkest hours of our life. I'm telling you, that is the biggest truth that I will say today. When we recognize the otherness of God, the bigness of God, the unimaginable of God, the uncomprehensible of God, when we recognize in the existence of that, only then can we be equipped with the relationship with God that will carry us through the darkest times of our life. So, the fact of this otherness, this immensity, this power of God, it's not intended to frighten people of God. It's intended to be the God that we need Him to be. And in order to be the God that we need, he can't be one of the boys. So, it's precisely because of these attributes that God knows, cares, and acts on our behalf. The challenge to us is this. The challenge to us is we are not equipped to understand it. We're not equipped to understand the way that God acts or the purpose behind it all, and, and we're not always equipped, maybe never will be equipped, to understand the why of it. So then what does that leave you with? Well, I'll give you an example. This is a, this is a, a rather benign example, but an example nonetheless. Just a, a matter of weeks after I became a Christian, gave my life to Christ, this woman 
uh, that I didn't know in the church. She walked up to me. She handed me a book, and she said, you'll need this. So I thanked her because I was taught to be polite, and uh, I kept it. I didn't read it at the time. Going forward six years, my first semester in Bible college, it was, um, it, the book was about personal evangelism. My, I'd, I'd forgotten about the book, but I, my, one of my first courses in my first semester was personal evangelism. That book was the textbook for the class. Yeah. That's crazy, isn't it? Okay, so here's a more, here's a, a more somber, personal kind of a thing. Most of you know, because I've been here a little bit now, um, that my mother died when I was six. Uh, she was 30. It's all very sudden. Um, it was one of those deals where I, I said goodbye to her, got on the bus, and I never saw her again. Um, now, my older sister Susan, it affected her in that she became uncaring about her appearance um, and uncaring really about her health. And, and sadly, that kind of followed her for the rest of her short life. My younger sister, Marion, um, who really in a lot of ways was kind of a carbon copy of me, we, we were only 16 months apart, we played together, we beat each other up, you know, we did all that stuff, like, you know, good healthy families do. And um, she became horribly, painfully shy, horribly, crippled. Uh, if people would look at her, she would cry. It was, it was really, you know... For me, I became empathic. I felt sorry for everything, you know, and I wanted to fix everything. Um, I, I wanted to fix everybody. I wanted to give my life to do that sort of thing. I even wanted to die doing that sort of thing. Well, so over the years, through discipleship, through the power of the Holy Spirit, those things in me became what I sort of recognize as kind of the hallmarks of my ministry in life, which is to feel what people feel and to find ways to act upon that. And so what I'm saying is no one, no one in the world can explain the death of a parent to a six-year-old in any kind of way that makes sense. And I don't think... I don't, I, I don't think at least Marion and I didn't even know what it meant that mommy had died. You know, I don't, I don't think we even knew what it meant until after a couple of years we just realized she was never coming back. So it's, all, it's impossible to look and see the hand of God involved in a situation like that. Is it not? It is. We are not, we don't have the point of view. We don't have the sophistication. We don't have the brain. In fact, you know, this is a tragedy in my, in my mind, in my heart. A great, brilliant biblical scholar named Bart Ehrman. He's written about 20 books. Sadly, most of the books that he has written in the last 20 years have been about why Christianity is false. Breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. He, he renounced his faith about 20-something years ago because he could not reconcile God as he knew God with suffering in the world. And this is a precise example of why I'm saying to you, it is absolutely imperative that you get this. God is completely different from us, and the, the principles of logic that we understand do not apply. Right? Now think about what God did to secure your salvation. All that went into that. Are any of us individually worth that? That's totally logical. But we don't have the ability to relate on that scale. So this passage of Scripture provides a guarantee 
of a sure result. Strength and peace, regardless of what else is happening in our lives. And it tells us how to experience this power. Now, Isaiah, in this passage, it is Isaiah making the comparison, not God. It's a comparison from a human point of view. You see what it says there in the passage. That God is above the earth and humanity is down below like grasshoppers. Isaiah's comparison. That, that the curtains of heaven stretch from, from horizon to horizon versus the little tent that we live in down here on earth. He dominates rulers. And, and in the time that this was written, these are all rulers that, against which Israel was powerless. So here's the comparison. God is, is so much farther, and we, in comparison, are like grasshoppers. But the beauty is, God doesn't see us as grasshoppers. God doesn't view us as grasshoppers. In fact, the amazing thing is that while that comparison holds, God's greatness is that He sees, he sees you, Joanne. He sees you, Joyce. And all the complexity, all the potential, all the marvelous, you know, extents of depth and breadth and height of the person that you are, in detail, much greater than anyone in your life has ever seen it. God sees that. Do you get what I'm saying? This greatness of God is not just in power, in dominance. It is a greatness, a greatness in his ability for detail. For you and I, it would be like understanding the detail without the science training of a molecule of sodium. You know, recognizing that a couple of the atoms are smaller than a couple of the other atoms. I mean, it's the same thing. Of course, we don't have that ability. I don't even know if we have that ability under a microscope. The greatness of God extends to his ability to see every detail. The people were saying, and Isaiah is quoting them, God does not see me. He's not taking care of me. It's a common cry. When I finished, I had, I had um, college was very hard for me. Uh, in the midst of really desiring to get the, the beginning of my education to be a pastor, there were, I, there were, I, I would say that there were personal issues that I, I could not I could not find a way of seeing them as having brought them on myself. They seemed to be just happening to me. Of course, you know, early decisions in life can impact the future and so on and so forth. But, you know, one after another after another, I was body slammed by these things. And by the time I finished college, I didn't feel qualified to go into the ministry. And I didn't understand why God let those things happen. Why did God let those? I was a good guy. I didn't, I didn't live a riotous teenage life. I didn't chase girls. I didn't drink. I didn't do drugs. I just wanted to serve the Lord. So why does this happen to me? And I took a 10-year walk. Yeah. Well, I, I walked away from God for 10 years of my life. Why? Angry? No, I wasn't angry. I just didn't understand. I couldn't put it together. Thanks be to God, the power of the Holy Spirit drew me back. And, and, and God is using those things in my life. But do you see when things happen to you that you don't understand, instead of being dismayed to the point of complete discouragement, God is calling us 
to understand that we can't see the end. And we can't see what he's doing now. And so God remains God and still cares for you. It's absolutely essential that we understand that. God says, I'm not too busy. I don't need a nap. I don't need a vacation. You are just not equipped to understand my ways. And so God says, instead of moving all your obstacles, solving all of your problems, taking away your hurts, disappoint your hurts, your disappointments, or the injustice that is happening to you, I give you strength. Amen. Well, I don't want strength. I want a solution. Now, God wouldn't say this, but, you know, me as a commentator, I look at yeah, well, what is it like to want? You know? But God doesn't say that. God, uh, God says, because once you recognize my strength in you makes it possible for you to face and walk through anything, you will never be weak again. Do you get that? Good. The greatness of God means that as creator, he's completely separate from creation. Creation could not create itself. <coughs> I, uh, <coughs> yeah, I blew my voice out. <coughs> but I meant it. I read something, you know, I, you know, I piddle around with science from time to time. Uh, it, it's a curiosity for me, particularly since so much of the world just hangs everything on science and math. So I came across, I came across this um, article about the, the beginning of the world, the Big Bang. And I, 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 I don't have a problem with the idea of a Big Bang. But it said that, <clears throat> so we know that every, all matter that exists was created at the Big Bang. And it was created from something that was compact to a, to a sub-visual level. And then it exploded. Now, from that time of the Big Bang until now, everything has been moving outward from where that it took place at the velocity of 160,000 miles per hour. That's what I found out. Okay. That's a long time. That's, that's, that's pretty fast. So, but see, the same thing is that, that every star and every planet was created when gases started spinning. And over time, they began to cool. How does that happen at 160 miles, thousand miles per hour? I don't get that. Um, then it said that the, the power unleashed at the explosion was, su was such that, thank you so much, you're a good guy, was such that, that light could, was not visible. It was too hot for light to be visible. Then I read about the, the formation of the planets that at, at that time, they became so cold that light was not visible. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I know. So look. Okay. Millions of people have placed confidence in this. Without a reason, I mean without an origin. We don't have an origin yet. Except I did read about an origin. There is a theory that the origin of our universe came when another universe bumped up next to it. I, I'm not making this up. Now, so with all of that, with people putting their lives, their educations, on the truth of that, <clears throat> is it impossible for you to accept that you can't understand God and that's okay? 
and that God can still act on your behalf as though you were the only thing that he created. I don't think, given what science embraces, I don't think that's a big stretch. <clears throat> now, you know, there is a scientific, there is a scientific uh, axiom that came into, <clears throat> came into being about 500 years ago. Have you ever heard of Occam's razor? Occam's razor? Anybody? Occam's razor? Yeah, okay. Occam's razor says everything else being equal, the solution that is the simplest is most likely to be correct. And I'll just leave that with you and you can decide which one's simplest. <laughs> too hot for light, too cold for light? I don't know. All right. So, when we get down to the personal level and we have a horrible thing happen in our life, we typically reflect in this way. God does not wish to act. God is not able to act. The beginning of our understanding is this. These observations come from the human inability to see all that God does. Delay is not equal to a lack of awareness, or a lack of ability, or a lack of compassion. These observations come from the human condition of becoming tired and weary and worn out with grief from becoming exhausted or becoming frantic. God does not experience such things. God's plans are not always discoverable by human beings. Now we get down to, towards the end, Chat, or verse 31, it starts out in your translations either with but or yet. Full stop. All this stuff, you know, all these things, people, people wear out. You can't understand. But they that wait, waiting is an act of faith. It's not... It's not about killing time. It's not about distracting yourself. Now look, I tell you, I've, you have and I have been in situations where uh, I remember a particular situation that temporarily drove me into a kind of um, claustrophobia. My anxiety was so high that I became claustrophobic. Uh, it was when I was in seminary. I actually had to, to go outside and sit on the porch to study because I couldn't stand being inside. That was, a, that was an anxiety response from a, a catastrophic event. You know, sometimes we fi try to find things to do to take our mind off of it. That's not waiting. Waiting is in the full knowledge of what is in the balance and placing and de determining in our minds that I know God is going to do something I don't know what it is. I'm going to wait and see what happens. It's not the same as, for, it's not, uh, it, actually waiting, waiting is an action. Waiting is not um, benign. Waiting is an action that we choose to take as opposed to fretting, as opposed to acting rashly, as to, opposed to a favorite of mine, freaking out. When, when you develop this waiting into a habit, a new habit, it becomes a life of confident expectation. 
wait, listen, and act. Wait on the Lord. Listen for Him to speak to you in your soul and through the Scripture. And then act in faith. Far from being crushed to the earth by their own helplessness, those who wait on the Lord, those who depend on God, can stretch their wings in the effortless way that eagles do and sail off on the wind. You know, you know what to do. Okay, thank you. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks to the Father. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples. And he said to them, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Afterwards, he took the cup, gave thanks to the Father. Then he said, This is my blood in a new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And so I pray, Father, that you will consecrate these elements to our lives. And that as we respond, as we take this cup and this bread, may we give you the anxieties of our life and draw strength from you. To, to live with you as born on the wings of eagles. In Jesus' name. You do not have to be a member of this church to take communion. Communion is for all believers. And I would say also it is for those even who are confused. The, tab- the Lord's table is open to you. It is a sign of Christ's sacrifice for you. So please feel free to come. We'll start at the rear and come forward.
Now, would you stand and receive the Lord's blessing? May the love of Christ be active in your hearts, be heard in your words, be seen in your actions, and inform your choices today and all days. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Go in peace. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, bind us together with love. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together.